week 10, this is the 10th uh, Composer Coffee Break, which is insane. This was just supposed to be something, or well, a way to stay uh, connected and together as a community uh, when it sounded like that we, we might be locking down for perhaps a week or two. I, uh, I definitely didn't imagine that we would uh, be doing 10 of these and still probably uh, more to come. But thanks for everybody for coming back on the chat. And thanks to our three extraordinary guests today. Um, some, some of the chats that we've had have involved uh, some of the sort of uh, dinosaur people like myself, who I uh, feel like we've been around for 7,000 years since the early dawn of time. Uh, and, and sometimes it seems so nice to, um, uh, to welcome people who are in their own beautiful ways, sort of making a mark right now and, and really contributing to the, um, uh, to the new generation of not just sort of sounds and not just music, but, but approaches as well. So we have got the amazing Ollie Julian. Uh, if I turn your camera on then, yay, there he is. Hiya. Um, Ollie, where, where are you beaming in from right now? Is it uh, India uh, or Philadelphia or? No, not that glamorous, although it's very sunny. It's uh, Sheffield. Amazing. Um, Yorkshire, so yeah. And, and, and Sheffield was, um, we're just saying is, is not home because I, I am a native Yorkshire man. So I was born and brought up in Batley, so a bit further up the road. But I, how are you acclimatizing to it? It's brilliant, to be honest. It's so nice to have like the peaks on the doorstep and we're opposite a park and we've got a little allotment going. It's really nice, to be honest. We moved up in October and so it's only like just coming into its own now in the spring. But it's it's really nice. And, and did you uh, did it go through your mind about moving out of London? Because we were you in London before. Did, did yeah, you I was. Yeah, I started off. I've been was in London from about two thousand six, and then I moved. We moved to Berlin for a couple of years, and then we moved back uh, about a year ago. But when we moved back, we sort of just realised we wanted to get out of London because you know for the kids and everything and so my wife's from Sheffield and we just thought it made sense. Totally. Have you noticed any change because it's one of the sort of frequently asked questions it's usually sort of framed as uh, uh, do I need to move to LA to be a film composer do it or if you're sort of in, in Europe do I need to need to live in London for for a lot of the amazing telework that you're that you're doing have you noticed any practical differences yet? Uh, not really, no. I mean, it, it, it's useful to have a good train line that you can get <laughs> to London quickly. And it is quite good, you know, you can get down in a couple of hours um, because, you know, obviously that is where a lot of my meetings happen, spotting sessions, recording sessions. Um, but other than that, no, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, you can kind of do it from anywhere now. I, th I think actually a lot, of, a lot of people will be really interested in that because it, I think it was probably the promise of the internet a few years ago was uh, that, that we could remote work and it would, and it would transform uh, where people worked from. Um, and, and I think maybe the, maybe the whole lockdown has, uh, has accelerated that process um, in, in that we're, we're having to do it now remotely. Yeah, exactly. And I think once this is all over, you know, I, obviously do like to go to London and, and see everyone and, and do everything and I think it's important that you know to be especially if you're starting out to sort of be uh, around at events and you know seeing people and doing stuff but you can definitely just travel in for that kind of thing especially if you're like saving money not living in the capital you yeah. just spend more on train fares <laughs> yeah exactly and in, in my case eating like i eat so much on trains even though it's like disgusting and plastic there's, there's just something hunger making about walking past a buffet car okay yeah. <laughs> definitely we'll have the twix please and, and the yeah. um, moving along to, to our next guest uh, the amazing john Opsted, who is uh, much closer to home in fact probably about three miles up the road from me as a fellow hey. north londoner we yeah we were, <laughs> we were talking john just before uh, before we started about because that lovely studio that, that you're in there is um, uh, kind of at the bottom of your garden. Do you, because uh, all, all four of us on the, on the chat today are uh, our parents. Did, 
did you think ever about kind of uh did you start with a room inside your house and then sort of move further out into the garden as the kids got older what, what was your thoughts um, um i think i think bottom of the garden probably overestimates how long my garden is it's most of the <laughs> um it needs but, to be a certain size before it can have a sort of like a, a start middle and end it just otherwise it just <laughs> yeah no, exactly um so um so i've been in this room for about nine years now um so longer than we've had kids I and basically um before I, I did have a studio room before this that i was renting um and it was much smaller it didn't have any natural light and i was spending a lot of money on the rent for this very small dingy room that i was and i had got an, an hour's commute to it each day um and then so when we moved into this house um just we kind of decided it just make sense to, to be able to work at home and um, kind of building something in the garden made sense in terms of soundproofing and stuff because it also um, like that was one of the real considerations being able to work at night you know when, when you're on a yeah. and you need to work through the night and I'm not very good at working on headphones I like to work on speakers all the time um, and also I used to have a drum kit set up in here and I'll <laughs> play, play the drums at all hours um, so, so not so family uh, friendly yeah uh so yeah exactly so um yeah just uh having having a space that's separate and it's kind of it, it works really well because it's it's separate to the house um and then I, I kind of come to work and go home um and yeah it just works really nicely oh beautiful well actually i have i think i have because both your studio and, and my room because i'm at, i'm at home now with a separate studio have both been on spitfire videos haven't they which means that you have this the peculiar experience of of uh kind of like your not quite your dirty washing or your your clean laundry as is behind me um being i i found it a quite a weird experience did you did you enjoy doing that the cribs thing i i found it very a very mixed experience my my privacy ometer was was ticking <laughs> quite quite loudly no i mean i'm you know i'm a bit of a gear nerd so you know it was good fun yeah people people can uh, can see around the edges of you they the, the sides of the fantastic collection, which we'll I'm definitely come back to. Um, <laughs> and and the, the fourth person, uh, including me, <laughs> on the panel today, uh, amazing, Amelia Warner, uh, or Millie to, to, to her friends. And I get, well, I'll count as all as friends here until somebody says something uh, embarrassing, in which case I will stop. Uh, how, what's your kind of work set up in terms of, because you're out in the country at the moment, uh, do you have a separate studio or work in the kind of uh, in a the room there? How how's it all work for you? Um, I have a separate, I'm lucky we have a kind of little um, outhouse that I've turned into a, a, a studio. We haven't been in this house for, for very long, so I haven't done much to it and it's still, it's really just got my piano in there okay. and my desk. And that's it. And then, um, so yeah, that's kind of something I'm trying trying to do at the moment is just get everything ready. And in, I had a really good setup in our old house because it was a studio, but it was hidden behind the the back of the garage. And um, and so the kid the kids didn't know it was there. So it was kind of brilliant because I could just I could be like, bye, I'm going to work, and they didn't know. Oh, so the coat and a hat bye. on. Yeah, and it's just... yeah. And they were, I used to crawl down the driveway sometimes when they were in a certain room, and I knew they'd see me, and I'd have to like crawl to get to the kitchen. And it was so silly, but, it, but they really didn't know it was there for like well over a year. So it was, I got a lot done in that in that studio. Was there a reveal much like the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus where they can go? No, it was just one day. My, my eldest daughter just arrived, was just there. I was like, no. <laughs> All my time is gone. Um, she worked out, my car was still there and she was like, hmm. Mm, where is she? We live in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, so she worked it out. Oh, um, do you find uh, that your working methods themselves or even this, your sort of imagination uh, musically is changed by what equipment you've got access to so do you sort of because you've at the moment just got a piano or a sort of you know a basic setup in there do, do you find where your musical head goes to is different yeah i think so although i'm i mean i'm not um i i pretty much always just write from the piano anyway or well, that's always where i start um 
you know, I very rarely write on anything else. Uh-huh. Um, so, so I guess that hasn't changed. And then I usually, I usually kind of write the, the skeleton of something and then I'll take it and put it into, you know, um, and start using samples and start kind of having fun with it. But, um, so it hasn't changed that much really. Um, but I've definitely just been doing a lot more just, yeah, just piano pieces um, without any other bits. Because, I mean, both, John, certainly, I mean, you, you and I share this uh, uh, expensive obsession for, for old, <laughs> old keyboards. And, but, but I also, I, I found over the years that I, that I would um, definitely try and choose the sort of tool for the, for the outcome that I was after, mostly having made lots and lots of mistakes. So I, I lo- I, quite old school, so I still like writing with, you know, pen and paper or pencil and, and paper. But I always write complicated stuff when I do it that way because I sort of I want to fill the pattern in on the paper. Whereas I know that you end up making it too over complex if you, m- if you write much it. too complicated, unless complicated is what is mm. is necessary. And and so that I I've kind of I feel like I've um, uh, got a little bit of a handle now on what method I'll use. I'll, before I start a cue or before I start a piece, if it's not in film and telly, where I'll kind of, uh, I'll go, uh, if I know I want it to be developed and full and complex, then I'll bust out the manuscript paper. But if, if I know I want it to be sonic, I'll make sure I'm in, in, the, in the room with some, some keyboards. Do you, do you sort of feel that you've got one integrated process or sort of different processes for different um, uh, situations? Um, I think probably more of an integrated process. I mean, I used to be quite of a, a pen on paper kind of composer, but I've, I've really, I feel like I've moved away from that quite a lot in the, particularly in the film and TV things. Um, I think I'm mostly, mostly working in the computer. Um, it's quite, it's relatively rare for me to move to pencil and paper uh, uh, to kind of generate an idea. Um, and then in terms of the synths and things, it's kind of, um, that's all to do with the palette. And often that, often the palette is the kind of start of the idea. So I, I often will start, I mean, it depends on the, on the kind of project, but if it's quite an electronic project, then I will often start at one of these instruments and be kind of playing them to, to come up with the idea, um, rather than kind of working with samples and then transferring it. It's, norm- okay. it's normally the, it's normally that I will work with the instrument that is kind of inspiring the sounds. Um, but so yeah, there's it, a sort it, of feedback loop then between the instrument and the idea and, and where it's going to go. And it's sort of, it, the, yeah, what's I mean, possible I mean, is that it steers you. Yeah. I mean, most, most of these are kind of, uh, middied up to some extent. So, um, but if, if, if I'm doing electronic stuff using these instruments, then I'll mostly be working in audio rather than MIDI and you know just recording ideas into the into the computer I'll, I'll usually have like a a click for the for the tempo and then keep recording ideas to that and then chop stuff up in the computer move it around um and then um and then if if something needs to be more kind of quantized um or it makes more sense for some reason for me to play it program it in the computer and then send it back to the synth then i'll i'll do that um but yeah, and, and recently I've been doing quite ele- some quite electronic projects. So I've been doing that quite a bit. But then equally, there are projects where I don't touch these things at all. <laughs> but they'll keep you warm. This is all yeah. very practical, very practical uh, yeah. consideration. It's, it's warm. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're very, um, I'm, I'm worried that they're going to fall. Like basically, when I moved into this room, it was obviously completely empty. And then over the years, I've been gradually just filling it with stuff. And it's all really heavy stuff. So I'm, <laughs> Slightly starting to creep when I move around. <laughs> I'm slightly concerned it's all going to just fall through. Some it's place. just going to in some sort of uh, a wormhole through to another dimension. It will come out, yeah. hopefully post lockdown and stuff. Um, Ollie, you uh, for you gear gear driving the ideas, ideas picking the gear. What have you got to hand? Because are you are you multi instrumentalist? <laughs> annoyingly. Uh, well, yeah, jack of all trades, definitely master of none. But um, yeah, I don't have anything exciting to show apart from a tester patch for some paint. Uh, um, we could ask the chat. We, can, we, we could ask the chat room. Is that a good? Is that a good colour behind Ollie's head? Is it, it, is it duck green? Nice. It is duck green. Nice. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, very, very, I, uh, like a Sherwood Forest Green, or is that, I mean, it must have a Farron Ball uh, name, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. well, it's Duck, it's duck Green, Farron Ball. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's going to be nice. Now, all, most of my stuff's at the studio in the centre of town, so I've kind of got a skeleton set up here whilst, whilst I'm not working in the studio. Um, but to be honest, most my projects can vary wildly in what in what they are and so it can often be um well it can be anything and so you know it's often something that I might start with a guitar or the piano or drums even just finding sort of the rhythm and tempo and the feel of it yeah. um so it's not really I do tend to sort of just sketch out ideas uh in the box and then worry about sort of re-recording them properly later just to get I always find it easier to get the sort of vibe going first I and see. then and then go back and replace things and make them sound a bit better and would you ever play people at what point would you share any of those demos do you sort of polish them till they're sort of like fairly complete or do you sh show your dirty <laughs> dirty washing a little sooner than that um, most of the time, till they're fairly complete, um, depends who it is sometimes. If it's a director that I've worked with before and they know me and we have a good relationship, then I might show something sooner. Um, but often, often I'll probably polish it up pretty good because, you know, the worst thing is someone comes back and says it sounds, you know, it's a good piece of music, but it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Ollie, do you mind if I just ask a question, Ollie? Because um, I, I really love with your um, with your music. There's like this um, quality to it, with um, where what is like you're saying. It's quite a wide range to your projects, but there's um, there are some where where it feels kind of quite intimate, and then somewhere they feel more broad in scope. And the the more intimate ones, I was wondering how much of it you're playing yourself, like how much of a multi instrumentalist are you? <laughs> um, well, I play I play the guitar and the drums and the bass and 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 the sort of piano quite badly. That's um, all. That's, then, that's all you need. <laughs> within those groups of instruments, you know, I play a bit of banjo, um, a bit of, you know, ukulele, that kind of thing. But anything that's you know, if, if I need the piano playing well, I ask someone else to do it, uh, and likewise with other instruments and obviously strings and that kind of thing. But yeah, I guess a lot of the more intimate things is often just me in a room um, because that's that's part of the process of getting the idea down. I can't really, I never really write things out on the piano uh, and then, you know, and write it completely before I know what it's going to sound like. I sort of have to do produce as I go, basically. I get you. Now, I, I, I want to... Um... Uh, talk a little bit about sort of about beginnings in the sense of uh, pretty much everybody that we've that we've chatted to and everybody who's on, on the chat room who's who's uh, a writer have, everybody's got, it's got a unique unique starting point and and it's I always find it fascinating then how that sort of determines the the curve and the arc of 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 your sort of journey through through composing and I know Millie in a way you're um, am, I, am I right in saying that that it was sort of EPs first and like arms and things like that 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 was that the first music that that you were commercially releasing and that yeah. that was the top of the top of sort of the, the top slice off of lots of things that you've done before but but that's when you found gave yourself permission to do it yeah it was kind of so I did um I did arms and I was and then I was um also releasing some music as slow moving Millie as a kind of singer songwriter but that was I think it was it was almost like a kind of um, side project, and then the stuff that I was releasing as Amelia Warner and the, the EPs and stuff was was the kind of music that I really wanted to make. Um, and um, and then through my second EP um, was called um, Visitors, and and a director heard some of the music from that and was interested in using it for um for a film and then it ended up kind of that i just wrote the score around that existing piece um oh, and, and, and before that i had already done a few i'd I've been doing some commercials i've been doing some shorts and so i knew that you know uh writing music to picture was 
you know what I wanted to do and where I kind of felt the most ex excited and comfortable and um, but it was but yeah it was a slightly strange path and have you found that um having initially sort of established yourself with that artist um sort of uh, putting out some music into the world that that was in your voice then uh because some of the artists that, that we've had on feel that they don't get offered the wider range of projects because they they sort of exist in people's minds as this sort of narrow uh narrow artist without the range but then people who've come up through the traditional film and tv composer route feel that they haven't got a voice they've got too wide a range and, and they they can't sort of speak as an artist do you, do, do you have a, an eye for how you'd like things to go over the next few years are, are there genres that you haven't done that you'd like to for instance yeah i think it's interesting and i think there's i think there's benefits and and then also you know always a downside to i think it's nice to have a sound and a signature sound and something that people you know think of you when they hear something or they think you know i think that can be quite a useful thing um to be to, to have something that's quite definitive um and uh and and kind of distinctive but then um then obviously you don't want to get pigeonholed into only doing that same sound again and again um so yeah i mean i think um i just yeah hope that i would get the chance to do all sorts of different genres and actually felt quite lucky to, to do when, when I did Mary Shelley because it felt like that was a bigger orchestral kind of movie and I got the chance yeah. to show it I think you know a different side to the more kind of simple piano stuff that I'd done up until then. Um, was it a, uh, a, a gear change in uh, lots of uh, practical and uh, sort of um, she would say emotional resilience ways was it was it a tough gig or a Dream gig yeah, it was. It was a. It was both. It was a dream gig and it was a tough gig. And it and it was one of those weird things where, creatively, I felt very sure of what I wanted to achieve, <laughs> and I had a very clear vision of it. But the execution was really tough. And even like I remember the first, because um, I'd only done one film before that, and then and even just the, the initial kind of sending stuff to the editor and not even knowing how to label it. And and him kind of saying, ah, it would really help if you wrote that, you know, just really, really simple things that I was yeah. doing so wrong. Yeah. Um, so it was, you know, a real learning, uh, learning curve. But I, but I did luckily feel really confident in what I was writing and in how I wanted it to sound. Right. It was just kind of getting it to that point and, and also getting the people that I was working with to, to imagine what that would be <laughs> and to have <laughs> to kind of sell it, sell the idea when I didn't necessarily, you know, because... I, I, it was hard to to imagine you know for them to imagine what it was going to be definitely definitely uh, john have you do you think that you've had the job yet that has kind of defined um a, a center to your to your particular sound do you think that uh that there is a, a core to it yet or are you are you still exploring do you think um I, i'm definitely still exploring um and i think um I think I've kind of identified aspects of, of that sound. Um, and I think, yeah, if there's, if there's one project I've done that's, that's kind of expressed that most fully, it's probably um, a thing I did last year uh, for Amazon called The Feed. Mm, um, God, unfortunately, it's, unfortunately, it's quite difficult to get hold of in this country, but it's on Amazon in America, and I'm hoping it will come to Amazon in the UK at some point, um, which is, um, was a 10-part science fiction series. Um, and the good thing about that score was, for me, was that it, it combined um, the electronics side of stuff with more kind of traditional strings writing and um, orchestral stuff as well. Um, and I think I think those those are the main aspects that I'm interested in uh, kind of exploring the most: are the electronic side of things and the strings side, um, and and really kind of just exploring both of those as, as fully as possible. So with the electronic really kind of, you know, going into all these instruments and, and trying to come up with new sounds and new approaches and things. Um, but I, I always feel that there's just so, I mean, there's so much music that I love and so much that I would love to explore that I don't think, I mean, yeah, I don't think I'll ever feel completely that I've satisfied all the areas <laughs> I want. No retiring yet. You've got, you got plenty, plenty to do. 
Uh, Ollie, we, we know your amazing comedy work. Uh, we, we seem as, seems to be sort of like all conquering in that if there is anything funny off the telly, then almost certainly you have you've contributed the score. And uh, accidental, deliberate. There was a, a one great comedy program maker you met early on, and everything stemmed from that. How 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 did that work, sir? Uh, yeah, well, pretty much the latter, to be honest. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't hurt that I really like comedy and I've always watched a lot of comedy. Um, but my first TV gig was a show called Spy on Sky One about 10 years ago, which was um, also a director called Ben Taylor's first TV show. And we just got on really well and we have done everything together since really. And now he's, you know, we've just done sex education together as well. So, you know, as he's, has he's grown, because he's become massive now and a really in-demand director, then I've just sort of held onto the back of him and carried on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think the great, the great thing is also that you get, you know, if you get work well with different producers and different editors and different directors, you know, there's always, it's kind of exponential sometimes you you know different people go on to work on different things and you go on to work with the same people on different projects I think that's one of the great things about being a composer is that you can often you know if if you get on well with people and they like your work the you know the work can grow exponentially sometimes mm. and it just happens to be all comedy because uh, that's all my clients seem to do that <laughs> um, <laughs> Do, do, do you think that in terms of your your sort of craft versus art balance, do you um, have sort of solo projects that you have in mind to do or that are sort of like doing a great job on a, on a film or TV show is uh, the, the sort of centre of your focus right now? Well, uh, yeah, it is the centre of my focus right now, to be honest. I, I always think I'll get around to doing an album um, but then I haven't just haven't had time, which yeah. is great because I've had plenty of jobs to do. Um, I find it quite scary because I don't quite know what I'd do if I did do something like that. It's I do find it easier now to be, you know, to have something to work to, a picture or a script or something. Yeah. I used to, you know, be a, a songwriter before I got into all of this. Um, but now the thought of doing that again is quite daunting because <laughs> you know I go back and listen to the the songs that I wrote when I was fifteen and cringe. So <laughs> fifteen, <laughs> I, I listened to cues I wrote last week and it's, it's <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> I think yeah. I think it, it kind of plays into and just coming back to you, Millie. It, there's there's uh, and I'm sort of going to squeeze together a, a a couple of questions that people have sent in about uh, one about demo reels from Nicholas Escobar and but also one from uh, Rosemary Armstrong who said that she discovered your music from Mum's List uh, particularly good for meditation and wondered if any of the composers actually have other things in mind when they compose a piece of music. I think I'm going to squidge those two and quite a few other questions into into a, a thing about uh, storytelling either musically, but also the sort of the story that, that surrounds us. So do, do you kind of, uh, coming from your sort of Slummy Millie project, which was very much about, about musical storytelling, are, are you driven by, very much by the, the story of uh, a, film and, a film or a TV show? And how do you feel about the music when it's taken in isolation? It, do, do you think that, has a story of its own at that point? Yeah, I, I think it I think it depends. I think sometimes um, I think sometimes they can and I think sometimes um, I mean with even with the um, the kind of EPs that I've released, I mean I'm about to I've got another one coming out in two weeks, which oh, luckily really? I managed to record before nice. um, all of this. And weirdly the theme of that EP is all about it's called Haven and it's all about home. Um, and it's about being at home, being safe, being in this kind of space, which we've all ended up you know, being in more than we expected. Um, but so, so around the EPs, I always kind of create some form of narrative 
Mm. And with the, the last one that I did, it was a kind of about an empty house and about the people who had lived in it previously. And so I, I think I have to, I think I need some kind of story to write. I find it really hard to just kind of write, you know, something that, um, you know, that is almost like an emotional thing or I, I, I have to make it about something else or about some kind of broader theme or some kind of broader story. Um, and I think that's why I really love writing to picture because you've got that thing to respond to yeah. that's kind of outside of you and outside of your experience. Um, and I, I prefer writing like that, I think. And I think that's why, yeah, with the EPs, they've, they've had a narrative to each one that I've kind of constructed. Um, I, I, I think that's uh, it's fascinating. Do you, in terms of the narrative, I'm kind of, because uh, I've had two or three questions from people as well asking about, uh, for, for all of us, uh, about our social media presence and, and what it means to kind of exist in sort of in, in society right now, what the story is that surround, surrounds us all as people and, it, and is it important? Because I think, when, I mean, when, when I started writing free social media, then uh, the narrative around each composer was very much more as Ollie described it, is the narrative is just told by the last person you worked with who who said you were either any good or you were useless. And, yeah. and the storytelling was really different now, but th there seems to be a, a, a pressure on young writers to, to not just for their work to have a story, but for them to have a story too. And obviously you're active on social media. Do you, do you uh, try and uh, naturally con construct a narrative around yourself as a composer, do you think? I, th I think I kind of resisted social media for quite a long time and, and I think I've um, struggled with what with navigating that thing because because I was an actress for a bit so I had a kind of a different kind of presence I guess um, and then I stopped doing that and I kind of re you know um, started doing other things and went on a kind of different path um, and then, and then I'm also I'm married to somebody who's well known, and it, so it can get really complicated and really difficult. And initially, I just found it a lot easier to have no uh, online presence and no to not invite in any of that kind of, um, you know, uh, just to not have that, just to not be thinking about any of it, and to just be trying to get on with working. Um, but um, but then I've also I, I sometimes think that there's a empowerment in like controlling the narrative a bit more, and having a little bit more um, you know of a say in how you what your story is and like you said and and not that it's and just kind of being a bit more open and a bit more honest about who I am and what my life is and the things that I find beautiful and the things that I'm interested in and the things that kind of inform my work and and inspire me and and so I've I, I've kind of been for the last year doing that. And I, I actually, I do like having that, um, that way of kind of presenting yourself um, with, with, no, with no kind of middleman. You're not relying on what other people are, other people are saying or, you know. But I have a, I'm in a weird position basically is what I'm trying to say yeah. with just other external factors yeah. that you know, I, I have to kind of manage. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I think it's interesting. And thanks, thanks for being, you know, just kind of straightforward about that. because. And, and come to you, John. I think, I think, in a in a sense, I mean, I'm sure, uh, that Millie has external factors that that sort of drive the storytelling around her. And I mean, the the limited experience I've got of sort of working on some on shows, maybe like Sherlock, that are, that were had a lot of attention. Then then there are moments when you kind of think that the story has has run away with itself without you. Uh, uh, really be, being on top of it, but do you do you consider uh, the the story of you as a writer uh, to be relevant, or is it only the story of your work? Um, yeah, I mean that's that's a tricky one, and I think um, yeah, I mean like I was saying earlier, I've kind of got loads of different musical interests, so it's, it's quite difficult to kind of project a, a version, you know, on social media of uh, you know to work out what that narrative is around you that you were mentioning um so yeah no it's tricky i, th I think um you know i just i i think i try and just keep focused on on doing the best work that i can and doing the best music and then and then see where see where that takes things to be honest yeah well ollie do you uh 
same for you. Is it sort of, um, is, is it work, work first? Do you, do, I mean, do you feel pressure? I know I'm sort of fairly regularly actively encouraged by productions or films that I'm on to, uh, to uh, uh, be quite public about the fact that the film's coming out. Do you feel any pressure to do that or offer you, is it just uh, work first? No, uh, I, don't, I don't really feel any pressure to, to do that. I mean, for me, social media is 80% promotional, I guess, uh, if I'm honest, um, and 20% jokes. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I, I, do, I do find it a funny place. And I don't like spending too long there. Um, it's kind of, I like it for information exchange um, and that kind of thing, but I don't, I don't spend too long there because I don't think it's, for me, I find, you know, it's not a healthy place to be for too long. Yeah, definitely. Um, and talking about collaborators, moving on, on to that, I, I think one of the, the uh, questions that, I, that came in was about um, uh, who we all work with and, and why. Um, I'm, I'm getting the impression, Oli, that uh, certainly for because you can, then quite a lot of your music making is on your own until you uh, maybe do strings and uh, and that's at a larger scale stuff. Um, do you have a regular engineer that you work with? Do you have do you, do you have a crew? Uh, well, I have um, recently. I've had um, assistants and I have crew of people that I regularly use, regularly use like um, at air for you know for, for recording and mixing and that kind of thing um, I do yeah I guess I do a lot of the first stages of stuff on my own and then and then I bring people in you know players or or, or whoever they might be um, later on down the line I have done I've also written uh, a few shows um, co-composed a few shows with Nick Foster as well oh, um, yeah. and how, um, how did you find that process of actually writing alongside someone oh great I think we've all we've always complemented each other quite well on on the way we on the way we work together I mean he's primarily a pianist and I'm, I'm primarily a guitarist <laughs> and I think that often helps um, and so we can kind of gel and work in the right way together um which is which is always helpful i think because yeah. if you offer i think if maybe if i mean i don't know this because i've never tried it but if you're both <laughs> the sim very similar then you're both sort of trying to do exactly the same thing it might not be as as useful in getting in, you know in building up the music and making it what it can be yeah yeah john, john you um uh did additional music for yeah you've worked with quite a few people if if the like, uh, yeah yeah is yeah um my kind of yeah that was my kind of initial start in the industry really was doing a lot of um kind of assisting work yeah mostly mostly additional additional music composing so um yeah the so the first two people I worked with were Jocelyn Pook and Sheridan Tongue um and then uh, Martin Phipps who's obviously been on here um um, Ruth Barrett and then um, Max Richter for a little bit and um, yeah and a few other people um, so yeah and I, I found that a really useful experience. Um, for the, I, I think quite a few people um, I, that it's been asked quite a few times how how you get a job as an assistant to a composer and and for you was it Grapevine once you'd got the first person or did you I mean, ever send uh, a CV? Yeah, well, so I, I um, so I, I graduated from the NFTS about 10 years ago, 11 years, 11 years ago, actually, um, and basically, and kind of came out of film school and then suddenly realised I had literally no idea how to find any work. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I just kind of thought, oh, that's it, you come out of film school and then you start working. And then yeah. I was just kind of on my own and realised that literally had no idea. Um, so, um, so then I thought it would just be a good idea to write to a load of composers kind of offering my services. Um, so, um, uh, in those days I was literally kind of burning CDs of my music and sending out letters in the post with my music and, um, you know, and it was kind of a 
few months later, I think that um, uh, kind of I got a phone call from from Jocelyn saying that she was uh, working on a project and um, you know tight deadline and needed some help. Um, and that that was a that was a copying job initially. So kind of um, taking a, uh, it was kind of taking a logic files and notating things into Sibelius and all that kind of kind of technical side of things. Um, and then um, um, but then I ended up doing a few other projects with her and and, do, and ended up doing some more kind of um, programming roles and things for her. Um, and and then with um, with Sheridan, he got me involved in um, the first project I did with him was the first of the kind of um, Brian Cox science TV series. Oh, of course. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, it was called uh, Wonders of the Solar System, I think, the first one. Um, and, um, and then I kind of worked with him for a few years on several different projects like that and um, kind of worked my way up until eventually he made me um, co-composer on one of the series of Silent Witness, which is pretty uh, good. Silent then, Witness um, has, has been just sort of, it, it as a show, I think has been equivalent to like an NFTS course. I know so many, so many Silent Witness graduates over the years. Is it as, yeah. how, how many series of Silent Witness have we now? Like 20? Well, I, I mean, I, so that, that was series 16, I think, and that was um, probably about seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But then, um, yeah, and then, um, and then kind of um, Martin Phipps got in touch with me. I think, I think I'd, I'd kind of written to him and, and quite a while later he got in touch with me and then he recommended me to Bruce Barrett. So, yeah, it was kind of, um, I'd kind of written letters to people quite rock quite uh, widely but then and then a bit of kind of word of mouth once I was working with people as well definitely um Billy did you uh when you were doing uh Mary Shelley did you crew up and and if so how how did you find your collaborators partners in crime um I I did um I, I worked with a really great orchestrator um called Nathan Klein and he works at Airedale and oh, um, amazing. Yeah. I um yeah I, I can't actually remember even how I kind of found him but I think it was just through somebody recommended Nick Taylor and then he, Nick said you know you should because I just needed help um you know fleshing out demos and, oh, and yeah, also with sure. um the, the orchestration and yeah. so he was he was incredible um and we've done a couple of projects since he actually produced um my ep that i just did that's coming out and he um we've also done a couple of shorts as well in between um but he's just amazing and it was really great having um working with him and i would definitely work with him again hopefully um yeah. so and but th that was kind of it it was kind of yeah. me and it was kind of me and him and i, I did probably did the initial um kind of couple of months first to just get the you know the the idea and the textures and the, the shape of it and then Nathan came in and you know just helped me get it to that next place and and help with the um the sessions as well oh uh, did you record at Aerodel? you were no we we recorded the EP at Aerodel and I we see. recorded um the, the short that I did but then the uh Mary Shelley we recorded it in Dublin oh did you oh uh big yeah. orchestra how how was it was it fun it was amazing yeah we had such an amazing um really great experience it was really it was it was kind of one of those things where i think there wasn't really an option of where it was like it had to be in in ireland just because of the way that they you know the the money was in the film yeah. um and um but yeah no we had like a really great experience with the um yeah with with, yeah, with yeah. doing it in dublin it was at windmill windmill lane um wow. studio and it, yeah, it was it was great it was really really fun i think often uh talking to um, a lot of other composers and, and, and also in my experience as well, that, that there's often something about those early relationships that you make that can, uh, that I, I think you often find people to work with at a time that's quite vulnerable, that <laughs> you feel like it's, um, which is often where, where strong bonds are made. So I, I know so many composers who, who actually do uh, work with the same people year after year after year and then end up doing 30 years 40 years with the same engineer or the same orchestrator or the same players to a certain extent and you and you kind of grow up and, and, and grow through because I can see why because I think if you have if you're lucky enough to find that relationship and you have to get through that kind of awkward initial period where you're finding language and and yeah. getting to know each other 
once you've kind of got to that point where you have a shorthand and you understand what each other mean and what they want and and i think it's it's kind of invaluable isn't it yeah no totally totally um i'm just going to flip to uh, uh to me just to check in with a couple of things on the chat room so we've we've had uh, uh lots of lovely questions which are really nice they um uh, I'm just looking down. So uh, we've done. How did you find your your first screen job? But also, I I think they uh, it's quite a few people uh, merely asking when your EP is out. And I think you said that was two weeks time. Yeah, that the, was the two weeks. Good job. Uh, nice plug for that. Uh, I'm going to come around to. Uh, um, what we're doing next and uh, and what kind of and what drives you so the one of the questions that i've been asking people is kind of why why you do what you do and uh we're all kind of we're all people with kids here as well has that changed when you had a family so ollie what why do you i mean because there are easy ways to make a living mate we both know this to be true <laughs> yeah. uh yes um, well, I originally started out wanting to do it just because, you know, I've always loved making music and I, you know, I was doing, I was writing music and recording music, you know, when I was at school and all that kind of stuff. And so I, when I realized that it was something that you could do for, you know, writing music for telly was, was a career, then, you know, it, it seemed like the dream job. So that was I guess what drove me initially and then I guess since then I mean having children has uh, I guess meant that there's a, a financial imperative <laughs> to, to carry on working. <laughs> That's right. Um, and um, yeah I don't know really I mean I, 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 I love doing it I it's, it's one of those things where yeah, for me, as a, as a not 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 a recording artist, as more of a, a I guess a composer, a jobbing composer, mm. it feels to me like what I lose in not having it as a hobby anymore, I make up for by the fact that I can do it all the time. It's great. So That's I sort of do. You, do you think there's a there's a sort of there's a, a a loss of playfulness that is just inherent with the fact that we need to do it when other people want us to do it. Yeah, I still get a kick out of writing, you know, figuring out what the sound is or figuring out what the melody is and, and all that kind of stuff that, that, is, that is the joy of writing music to me. Mm. Um, and then, so that, that stuff never goes away. Um, but you, you know, in order to make money for it, from it, you have to kind of just put up with all the, the, the less appealing things like, <laughs> you know, feedback and uh, <laughs> deadlines. So exactly. It's, yeah. swings and roundabouts really the joy is still there for you john uh, why do you do it um yeah the, the love of it really i mean mm. i kind of uh, grew up loving music and loving film um yeah. and and then kind of from that loving film music and probably lo loving film music quite early on i think i was listening to kind of a lot of bernard herman and stuff when i was quite young and uh, <laughs> inappropriately young your parents yeah, exposed yeah. you to uh, yeah. psycho it's yeah, definitely like watching hitchcock films before i understood them and stuff like that um and then um yeah and then i just like was just listening to a lot of different soundtracks and stuff and really got into film music quite strongly um so yeah that's that's definitely i definitely do it for the love of it yeah, 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 yeah. the um uh do you think that is the thing that will sustain you through uh, through a whole career. I, I, do you have goals that are separate to that? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of that kind of balance of recording artists, film composer thing. I mean, um, I, I mean, I, I recorded two two albums while I was at university that I kind of released myself, but were very different to the kind of music I do now. And then um, I haven't actually released any albums since then. But I've been, I mean, I've been working on. Um, an album project basically for about the last seven years. Um, <laughs> Hurry up, John. Come on, crack on. Well, yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it's in it's it's kind of it's kind of in its its third incarnation now. But I think this is this is definitely the one where it's gonna that's gonna reach the finish line. 
um, and um, so so I definitely have that side of things as well. Um, where and it and it is quite different. I, we were talking about this earlier. The um, the process of of you know writing film music where you're responding to a narrative and you're you know you've got that framework and the images to respond to and how that makes you work and you've got yeah. all that inspiration and then writing album material where you um like the possibilities are wide open and it's really it can be really challenging working out how to hone it down into into what you want to do and that, that's partly why it's taken me quite a while to to put that together um but yeah in terms of where I'm going with things um the album side of things is is quite a big thing for me as yeah. well um and um yeah and I mean I'm I'm quite lucky that I've got I've got the um I have a, a game project that I do as well as the film and tv things so ah. uh, um which is really useful at the moment because that's completely set up for remote working it always has been so, and so. and we'll just go on and on is, is it a, is it a franchise one yeah it's um rainbow six for ubisoft so it's um it uh yeah it's an ongoing an ongoing project and yeah, yeah. Um, and as a game company they're completely set up for remote working from home so um yeah so i'm, I'm, I'm lucky that that kind of carries on at the moment um and then um yeah and um and I just, uh, in, in terms of the, the lockdown period, I, I had a, a project that was just reaching the end when the lockdown started. So it was kind of at a late enough stage to, to finish. Um, so that, um, and that's actually uh, begins on TV this Wednesday. It's called oh, Wednesday. hello. So, uh, we, I, I think we, Ollie, we, we, we need a full set of plugs. So, so John, <laughs> yeah. what's, what's the show that starts? Uh, it's called We Hunt Together. So that's the, um, so that's the kind of thing I've been working on in the TV side of ah. things for a while. And now I'm, now I'm quite pleased to have a little shift and, and work more on the, yeah. um, have a little time to work on the, more on the album side of things and more kind of self-generated music, you know, music that is more from me. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, and then in terms of, so, you know, in terms of my kind of path moving forwards, yeah. I'm enjoying balancing those different, those different areas. Beautiful. Um, really I, I said, what? I say having time to work on that, but obviously with the kids, there is. No <laughs> yes, exactly. The kids do. Really, do you? Uh, what? Why do you? Why do you do it? Why? Why write? That there are definitely. I mean, I've always done it, and it's just something that, like, since I was really small, I just would always um, come up with with melodies and compositions, and it's just something that I've just always, always done. And then I, and I, like, similar to John, I just love, always loved films, and I always loved music and I loved film music and so I guess the idea you know once I realized that that was something I you know potentially could do that was just the you know the, the dream for me um and um and and strangely since having children I found that it's it really kind of um distilled what it was that I wanted to do and I, I felt kind of more determined and more sure because I've got three daughters and I just felt like this is what I want you know I want them to see me doing something that I'm passionate about and something that I love and I want them to see that that is possible. Um, and so, and then I've also just been really excited about, you know, all sorts of different storytelling and like we were saying yeah. with, with my own kind of releases and the EPs and then during lockdown, I've been working on a musical idea that I've been thinking about for years and years and years. It's an adaptation yeah. for a children's musical. And so I've been doing that and that's just been a really fun, that's been a completely different um, experience but really really fun and I just any way of music um, kind of uh, music and narrative and stories and telling stories with music is just I find it just kind of so much fun and I, I love exploring all different ways of doing that. I, I find the uh, your, your comment about about family and your daughters and and them having a, a kind of role model really I find that really interesting because I know for myself that that I've spent probably more hours working on stuff that I'm less convinced of the merit of than I that I I'd like to have some of those hours back if I could, and and so now with a, with a couple of little kids I think I'm steering my ship a bit more to be a bit more selective and, and sort of quality yeah. over quantity. And do yeah, I was a slow starter though. I felt like I, it took me a really long time to figure yeah. out what it was I wanted to do. You know, I kind of, yeah. I, I was so, so I didn't get there until recently. So now that, you know, I kind of, 
um, that I'm doing it. Yeah, definitely. Oh no, that's, that is brilliant. Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, round up because we're we're coming uh, close to the en end of our hour, our allotted time together. But I think w one of the reasons that I was really keen to have these uh, three wonderful people join us was to kind of uh, maybe uh, balance up for for our community that sort of built up that there are so many different ways to um, to express yourself and to and to uh, to work either from the artist point of view or from kind of coming up through the ranks point of view or you know kind of just um, as Ollie was describing meeting a great program maker and coming up through uh, through that path because the I, I think there's there's a sort of um, there can be a, a concept that there is just one way to to do this, and uh, and I think everybody from from like Dan Pemberton earlier on, everybody has has got a totally different story that I think are really uh, are really valid, and and actually it's usually the things that kind of make you um, kind of make you different that are the things that are attractive to people. Um, obviously, you've got to be able to do the job. But it, it's those things that are very much you. So I would, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd hold on to the things that are you and, and try not to uh, hand them over to sound like anything else. Just going to go back around so that everybody can uh, say goodbye to the, to the wonderful people who've been joining us in the chat room. If we didn't get to your question, we read them all on the way through and, and we're super grateful um, for everybody joining us. Uh, uh, Ollie, do, do you have any uh, uh, final remarks? This is the, the, the kind of bit where you... Uh, I don't know. This this is the time to just yeah, final it. thought. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's the um, it's the bit of sort of like at the end of the Radio Four news broadcast, just before it goes to the hour, where somebody goes, "Could you say something <laughs> in twelve seconds?" That would be lovely. Um, I'd say this. The, well, I was just on, to your point. I'd say the single uh, most important thing I would say to anyone who wanted to get into this business is to find a, a, a you know a director or a producer or anyone who's yeah you know starting out at the same time as you are because i think that is the key i think that's the key thing and making those relationships when you're young that you'll foster and carry on with as you get older yeah no it's a super strong john what would uh, if you had uh, had the floor yeah. for a I, I i was going to jump onto the same point actually um from when ollie said that earlier about having having a a, a director who you know were, were at a similar stage starting out and then kind of growing with them um, cause yeah, I mean, I, I've had a similar thing that the, um, the project I've just finished was directed by the director who gave me my first break into, into TV drama. Um, so yeah, I, I think kind of trying to nurture those relationships is, is really important. Um, and, and trying, trying to kind of be someone that people enjoy working with as much as as much as possible <laughs> as much as humanly possible <laughs> yeah as much as that can be difficult you know with <laughs> and deadlines and rewrites and all of that kind of stuff yeah trying to let all that wash over you and just want to be as zen about it as possible i'm, I'm sure john you were a delight to work with <laughs> <laughs> never raise your voice at any time mm, maybe. Mm. everybody's got a dark side <laughs> and millie would you what uh, what would be your final thought for the room um, yeah, I agree with with that. Um, just try to be, uh, you know, a nice person to work with. And I think especially with film and TV, and you know, it's very often like it's not about you, and it's about a bigger, it's a collaborative thing, and it's about, you know, it's it's your music is part of that, but it's not, you know, the you can't obsess too much about how you know you think it should be. It's all about taking notes and being flexible and I think that's really important um, but I would also say to really trust in your instincts and try and really just listen to you know your first reaction to something is often really the mm, most interesting yeah. or the most most kind of the thing you will end up probably coming back to after doing like 10 other things in between so I think that's something that can be a really a real strength is just just going with that first instinct and really trusting it totally can I, can, I just, can I just say one more thing? <laughs> uh, no, definitely not. Of course you can. <laughs> uh, everyone should watch John's Lego stuff. It <laughs> oh yes, the Lego, the Lego. <laughs> it, it, it's the best thing I've seen on telly. Well, <laughs> or on my phone. Uh, <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's funny, from what we were talking about earlier in terms of kind of the narrative of your social media. <laughs> 
And if there ever was one for me, I've completely ruined it in the last <laughs> week. Lego with my kids. <laughs> it's so beautifully frame accurate, though. I mean, it's just. <laughs> impossibly good and exactly what people should be doing in lockdown it's genius work and I, I, I was very pleased to get a compliment from the uh, special effects guy from Bond on our explosion in it so, <laughs> <laughs> one of the best of feedback I've had in a long time <laughs> <laughs> no animals were hurt during the, uh, the making of this uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to, uh, to chat with you all uh, and, and I think that they, the, in very strange times just these moments of, of connection for everybody and to everybody in the chat room as well and, and and if you're watching this later on YouTube then it's as if we're chatting to you now I know you might be watching it later but it's uh, I think we need all the connection we can get right now and there's just gonna be two more of these chats this is very nearly the end there's another one next week and then one the week after uh, next week's and the one after will be quite special I think um, no this wasn't this is was also very special uh, so uh, I really um, yeah I, I sincerely thank everybody who's uh, who's joined in as as guests the brilliant people today but also everybody in the chat room for for all this connection there'll be a report on the mentoring scheme uh which finishes in two weeks as well so we hope to get some feedback from that but in the meantime uh be kind uh, look after your families and stay safe and well and uh hopefully see you next week bye bye everybody bye bye <laughs> you're allowed to say bye bye from the panel now as well bye bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.